we make all of our own food from scratch. Um, we, you know, avoid like protein isolates. We try to use as many whole food plant-based ingredients as we can. I mean, our next short-term goal is like launching 20 new, 20 new locations the next year. But of course, you know, the goal is to launch, how do we launch hundreds or thousands of these locations globally? Really like what we want to do is offer food that is cheaper and better mm -hmm. than other people are offering, right? I mean, because ultimately, like, if we're cheaper than the competition, if, you know, you're going to go to your favorite fast food restaurant and it costs six ninety nine for a burger, in our place it's five ninety nine for a burger that is bigger, better, tastier, healthier, better for the planet, better for yourself, like, which one are you going to pick? Problems are what? Problems are profits! Welcome to the Problems or Profits podcast hosted by Matt McKeever and myself, Rebecca Lynn Matheson. Today, we have a very special guest on, James McKins, and he has actually gone from what started as a personal health journey, turned into one of the world's first vegan fast food chains that's now publicly trading on the TSX. So I'm really excited to have James here. And before we get into the conversation today, I just want to talk a little bit about what problems or profits means to me. And for me, it really means seeing any obstacle in your way and being able to adapt and overcome it. So mm -hmm. it's really a, a decision that you make to continue to evolve and grow and push past whatever is in front of you in order to achieve your ultimate goal or achieve that success that you're you're striving for. So welcome James to the Problems or Profits podcast today. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Yeah, really appreciate you joining us today, James. And uh, so the first warm up question we'll get started with is what's the most expensive thing you've ever broken? Um, it's a good question. Um, I guess my food truck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Is there a story probably. there? <laughs> um, like nothing too crazy. It just, it's just basically like we, we kind of got in a bit of a accident with it and, um, uh, it was down for like, I don't know, maybe like a month. Um, so not only do we kind of like seriously damage the food truck, but also, um, we had to cancel like a whole bunch of events. So that was pretty, a pretty expensive thing to happen. But then again, I don't know, it wasn't really like anyone's fault. It just kind of like, you know, we had a kind of like a mechanical failure. And, but um, yeah, that was, that was pretty crappy thing to break. Yeah, that's not ideal when you have events lined up and uh, food ready to go. So um, yeah, how did, yeah, how did sure. you adapt or overcome that? Well, uh, you know, it was a bit of a crazy situation. We were actually, uh, one of the staff was driving the truck to, um, to West Toronto and basically had this breakdown and we had to like, we had to get a, a tow truck to tow it, which is, I don't know, you know, you need crazy tow trucks to, to tow other trucks. So, um, and then we had to like go and like unload all the food and like, you know, um, make sure like, uh, obviously the food stayed cold and that kind of stuff. So it was, it was really like a challenging uh, experience for sure so but um you know just, just one more thing that happens when you're running a business i guess absolutely absolutely that's that's wild man that was obviously pre-covid times when you could actually have events yeah yeah actually yeah it was yeah. that's awesome all right next warm up question here for you james is if you had a million dollars and only 24 hours to spend it before it disappears what would you do or spend it on uh, I would donate it, hundred percent. Yeah, I would donate it to like, um, you know, one of the vegan organizations we work with. Awesome. And uh, last question here, James, on the warm up is just, why are you you? So, what makes you you? Um, like I guess from from a personality point of view, I suppose it was just like, you know, my upbringing, how I was raised, like type of like environment I was raised in the city, the schools I went to. So, I mean, I guess like you could, you could kind of say like, that's what forms us as people, you know? So I think I was kind of fortunate to grow up in a, in a house and with parents that were really like, kind of like um, supportive of like um, my imagination and creativity and, you know, really fo the focus on like self-exploration, that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I think, I think really just from, you know, from my parents. To be honest. 
Yeah, definitely appreciate that, James. And one of the questions that I, I really wanted to dive into, and I guess this builds off of um, your your kind of history with your parents and having really a great support network. Um, I'd love just to start the, the podcast off today by hearing a little bit about your background and how you actually got into the industry and business that you're in. Um, Cause I understand that you actually had a business prior to this. So I'd love to just hear a little bit more about um, how you actually got into this and a little bit more about your background. So yes, yeah, seven years prior to this, um, I actually ran a software company, um, which I founded um, back in 2006, I guess, 2007. And um, that company was a um, uh, was a technology company that created like um, high frequency automated trading systems for like the financial markets. So it was like pretty high tech stuff. So. I kind of built on my background in uh, Gen X and computer science, which I, I, I did a degree at Western there um, in that. And, uh, you know, use that kind of like knowledge and my experience in the capital markets to build that business. Um, but, you know, while running that business, um, there's two things that kind of happen when I think when you're working in finance. The, the one thing that happens is that you do a lot of sitting. And the other thing that happens is that you don't really, um, uh, you know, you, you don't really, really, really do any like good for the world you know it's just all about money and there's not a lot of like i guess um satisfaction that you're actually like making any sort of difference um for any for anyone or anything so those are the things i didn't like about that um industry i really wanted to like feel like i was making a difference and you know changing the world and that kind of stuff and it, it'll, it was only when i went vegan where i kind of found that purpose so while I was running the software company, I went I went vegan for health reasons. I was like uh, I was diagnosed with high blood pressure um, when I was 32, and basically just thought I'd try like a vegan diet just to just to see how I would feel, and um, you know it it made a huge difference in my health. Um, and then just kind of like got into the into the, I think I guess the plant based slash vegan industry at that point. Awesome. And so do you mind maybe just exploring with us how you jumped into that industry? Because, you know, they don't naturally feel like once you crush it in the financial world that like jumping into vegan restaurants or vegan fast food sounds like a natural transition. So what did that look like? Did you know from day one that you were going to build the business that you've built? No, no, definitely not, actually. It, I mean, it, it, it didn't start as a business, to be honest. I mean, it was more like a grassroots vegan organization, I would say. Um, so it started as like a buying group where we were just like buying, I was buying like fruits and vegetables for myself. And I was getting like cases of oranges or cases of like kale and stuff like that. And, you know, obviously it was too much food for me, but um, but we, we were like juicing a lot and like, you know, eating like, like a lot of like raw foods at the time. And so we were, I was just splitting it with friends. So it kind of started with me and like 10 friends. We would just, I would, uh, you know, order some food from like a uh, produce distributor and they would like drop it off and we would share it. So it kind of started as that. Um, and that actually grew um, substantially in London. It kind of, there was more people that wanted to join it. More people were starting to get like, really excited about eating, uh, you know, healthier and, um, I guess a lot of the people, they weren't necessarily vegan, but just people that wanted to incorporate more fruits and vegetables into their diet, um, which obviously is a good idea for anyone to do. So, so it kind of grew, like we grew from that to like 24 people. And this was all kind of running from my parents' house at the time. Um, so I was just running it from like the, you know, the garage, so to speak, uh, literally started in my garage. I feel like everyone, every, every single like entrepreneur starts in their parents' garage. So I guess, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I'm included in that category. Um, so yeah, and then basically from there, it just got too big for me to do it out of my garage anymore. And so I got like a warehouse and then more people started joining. I I created like an online ordering system where people could order and, and we ended up doing delivery of produce around London. Uh, we ended up having like hundreds of people like buying with us and we were like, you know, the biggest customer for these for this produce supplier in, in the city and, you know, do just, just turning out ma like we're just like turning massive amounts of, of produce um, every week um, and then it kind of grew from there to like we, we ended up getting um, leasing uh, Farmer Jack, the old Farmer Jacks which is like a produce uh, well it was a former apple orchard 
Um, and we took that over because again, we wanted to launch like a market there where people where we could offer like other products. So not just produce, we kind of got into like, um, you know, we had, we had kind of like a, like a vegan supermarket where there was all like kind of plant-based products that you couldn't get in the grocery store or were really hard to find. And so we ran that for a number of years and then, um, we got into, uh, we were, we were starting to do like prepared food, the market, like burgers and stuff. Cause at the time it was like actually really hard to find a good, like homemade veggie burger. Um, actually still is really, but unless you come to, to our restaurant, but, um, but, uh, you know, we, we then started, um, uh, you know, just people, people loved like coming to the market and having a bite to eat. And it was just a good, like, kind of like fun, you know, weekend thing to do. And then we ended up, and then I guess we got into kind of fast, uh, fast food through actually our meal kits. So we developed these meal kits where people could, and I mean, at the time, I mean, now there's lots of them, but at the time there was just, I think there was just chef's plate in Canada and us. And so we started doing vegan meal kits and we, you know, we had, we developed like a number of recipes that we, that we ended up using now in, in fast food. So, um, so a number of those recipes were developed and we launched actually um, one of them at the Rib Fest 2016. And that was our, um, what we call now the famous burger. At the time it was called the Big McInnes, but uh, McDonald's didn't like me calling it that. So um, we ended up uh, renaming it to that, that burger. And then from there, we just kind of launched into fast food. Yeah, I, I I love that, James. It's it's really cool just to hear like the evolution of of the business too, because it clearly like started from something that was really personal and something that you really cared about, and you were able just to provide that to the community around you. And it, it's it's really interesting to um, the timing of this because I I definitely feel like as you evolved into this market it was actually really growing and expanding and I'm sure like by building a business like this it helped to contribute to that because it's just making vegan food more readily accessible to whoever wants it right so I think that that's a really cool evolution of all of the different stages was there any anything that you tried out along the way that didn't end up working out or or that you just like really were able to build a platform or learn and and grow into the next thing from like even even the the food boxes it sounds like you're able to actually create recipes that now you're using today yeah i mean you know we we were all i mean i think as any entrepreneur you're always looking for market validation and what you're doing so you mm -hmm. try to take your own like opinion out of it and you try to say like, even even though there be, our meal kits were an incredible product, they were a fantastic product. They were just, they were, they were just amazing. Anyone that that had them would probably like agree with that. But you know, the just the the, the demand for a vegan meal kit wasn't there in mm. in, the, in society and in, at the time. So, you know, we um, you, you can kind of have the best product in the world, but if it's if the world's not ready for it, or if the timing is not the right time, then it it, it won't work. You know, so. Um, and I think ultimately maybe it was like too much commitment for people, you know, um, it was just like, you know, um, for whatever reason, it, it wasn't something that we ended up continuing. So, but we, but from that, you know, it was like a stepping stone because we took, we took that, um, we took the, you know, the best thing about that was we, we learned what people actually did want and what they did want is they wanted the, we wanted plant-based versions of food that they like had a connection with from their childhood mm -hmm. right and that they maybe don't eat anymore or they can't eat anymore um, because you know even for example even though you know i wasn't vegan for a long time i still didn't eat lots of fast food you know it was just like because i just felt like ah oh, it's just bad quality food and like i felt guilty about eating it and you have this kind of guilt with fast food that mm -hmm. it, that always was really like um i think uh you know, is, is a challenge uh, for the industry, right? So, and and I think what we do is we kind of remove that we remove that guilt where it's like, hey, listen, like you can indulge again. You can have the things that you love and not feel like you're ruining your body, you're ruining the planet or killing animals. You know, you can do the things that you love without any guilt. And I think that's there's a huge market for that, not just for vegans, but honestly for anybody, because, you know, um, this is something that I think everyone struggles with is, is the idea that we, we want to indulge, but, you know, you don't want to feel bad afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm curious, James, you know, was there a moment in time where 
this went from being a co-op or just kind of a thing you were doing to it was officially a business? Like, was there a moment that you were like, okay, this is going from hobby to full time or did it literally just evolve that way? Um, you know, I would say it just evolved, but I mean, I, I, I guess kind of when it went to a business when we started in the rest in the restaurants, you know, uh, because basically we kind of like, until that point, we were very much like community room. Like we had volunteers that were coming and like packing bins and like that kind of stuff. And we were still very like grassroots at the time, which, um, which was, uh, you know, it was cool. And, and I think, um, but you know, as you grow and as you evolve at a certain point, um, you, we just kind of grew into like, you know, a real business where, you know, you got to pay the bills and, you know, yeah. you have to, you have to have a way of making it sustainable and to run on, on its own. Right. So we, uh, yeah, I mean, I think at that point we just really kind of, um, we got, we got a little bit more serious about what we were doing and, and just, you know, especially from like the financial point of view. Gotcha. And so I'm curious when you launched like the first official restaurant or whenever the first like big financial endeavor occurred, was it all self-funded? Did you go pitch the bank? Was it difficult getting investors or buy-in into this idea? Yeah. I mean, I tried to get some, I, I, back when we were at Farmer Jacks, I did try to get some, like uh, some investors on board. And, you know, to be honest, it just, uh, I, it was, it was tough at the time um, because we, we were still kind of, I think really early in, it's like kind of a grassroots business. Um, so we, like I was just entirely self-funded um, for, for a long time. Um, and that was difficult obviously, because, you know, um, I only had so much savings from, from, you know, from back when I, I you know, was running a software company and um, just kind of blowing through that, just trying to keep this going was tough um, because, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't profitable really ever. Um, um, so our goal was always just to kind of break even and, and make the prices so that, you know, we could provide the kind of a service. So we were, we were always doing this just to kind of like, um, to provide a service to the community. And, uh, and so at that, so but then later on, like, as we obviously kind of uh, we built the restaurants and we had some, quite a, quite a bit of success with that. Um, we got our first investment and we, uh, when we launched our manufacturing facility in 2018, that was our first actual um, external investment. Gotcha. And at that point in time, was it a lot easier because you had the success that you'd built over the years? Um, you know, was it a lot easier at that point in time talking to them versus when you were at uh, Farmer Jack's? Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, we had more market validation. We had more revenue. We had... I think we had something that was a little bit easier to wrap for investors to wrap their head around. You know, it's one of those things where it's mm -hmm. like, I think it's important to understand, like for investors to understand, like, what do you, what do you, what is it that you do? What is the value? Like, and how are ultimately they're going to get a return at some point in time. So, um, you know, I think, I think really like the, the vision um, became a lot more clear and the, the, um, the ability to, for us to, you know, disrupt the industry was starting to kind of emerge. I think that was really exciting for investors. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's it's one of the the first in the world, right? A vegan fast food restaurant. So definitely very disruptive in that industry. So it's 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 cool to see the evolution as well. What actually drove you to the fast food specifically? Like what about that business model did you mm -hmm. like or did you see a pathway forward with? Well, I think the power of fast food is is a few things. Number one, it's really low commitment for people. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to get someone to try a plant-based burger, it's like, here, try a burger for like six bucks. You know what I mean? It's not a big commitment. It's something that anyone can just try. And mm -hmm. so I loved that about it because, you know, we really changed from being like a plant-based, um, well, I guess like a, like a health-focused organization to really more of a vegan-focused organization. And... And I think it's important to kind of like understand the differences between those, those two things because, you know, veganism is really more, well, it's all about, you know, um, your, um, you know, kind of like where the money goes, right? Like what does your money support um, versus like necessarily health? So, for, so I, I guess for all intents and purposes, I really became, you know, vegan when we sort of like launched our, our fast food um, chain and the, with, with the idea that like, 
really the important, like obviously health is important, but it's not the only important thing that we need to do. Um, we need to like really take a charge with the environment and really take a charge for how we treat animals. So that became the focus when we, when we started doing fast food. So I love that about fast food, that we really could focus on sustainability and of the planet and the food. Um, and, you know, there's obviously an aspect of, of uh, health to it. Like we, like, I'm not going to sit here and say that our food is like healthy, but it's it's healthier than than, than other fast food options. So we still have like indulgences like fries, menu rings and that kind of stuff. But, you know, like our patties are made, are made from chickpeas. Like we make all of our own food from scratch. Um, we, you know, avoid like protein isolates. We try to use as many whole food plant-based ingredients as we can. Um, and um you know we don't have any cholesterol in the food you know we, there's a lot like a lot more fiber and that kind of stuff so there are health benefits to eating at our restaurant and i think that's kind of like that was kind of a change is finding that balance i think for us gotcha so really focusing on like the actual product and outcome and um that vegan like mindset and and uh, like really embodying that kind of um veganism um, overall, that's that's really interesting that um, you kind of felt like when you went into that restaurant itself, that's when that transition really happened for you. So um, did you have any mentors along the way, like both on the business side or like as a vegan? Um, you know, not really, uh, to be honest. Um, you know, I was in, I was obviously heavily like in the vegan community, like I, <clears throat> I knew a lot of people in the community. So, I mean, I guess you know, our, the mentorship was just, you know, I think there's a lot of people that we were just like, I was talking to and we were all like mm -hmm. communicating, talking and like a lot of like debate and discussion all, all the time. So I think just being part of the community provided that kind of like mentorship and support, you know, to be honest, like um, everyone I talk to or everyone that's in my life, I always, you know, it's always kind of like a um, an opportunity to learn from them and to like gain knowledge and, you know, also share my knowledge too. So um, so yeah, I mean, it was just, I think the, the, as a whole, the, the community kind of like really helped, help um, you know, guide our business. Absolutely. And now that you've gotten to this point with it, what's, what's the next goal and, and how do you progress forward to the next evolution? Cause you're, you're really, you've grown a lot since you first started that first restaurant. So what's that next evolution and next goal with the company? Well, the next goal is really just scaling at this point. Um, yeah. So, you know, how do we, I mean, our next short term goal is like launching 20 new, 20 new locations the next year. Um, but of course, you know, the goal is to launch, how do we launch hundreds or thousands of these locations globally, right? And how do we really change the food system? How do we disrupt fast food? How do we, you know, how are we going to, what new technologies are we going to develop that are going to fundamentally change how we, you know, make food, feed the world? Um, that kind of stuff. So, the 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 uh, our focus now is obviously on food technology, and I think that's really the, the big change for us because through technology we're able to scale, and uh, you know, tech, uh, being a technology expert myself, um, it's it's kind of getting back to I guess um, another passion of mine, which is pretty cool. So it's it's fun to kind of combine the, the the food and the technology. I think to to drive change, and I think this is. Uh, really how we're going to make a big uh, difference in the, in the planet. That's awesome. How do you, how do you see like the technology difference in your company? Like how are you trying to push forward and, and disrupt with technology? Um, there's a lot of different ways. I mean, the, the, the technology around how we manufacture food. So for example, um, you know, how do we make plant-based food that is, um, you know, still healthier or still like low process, but how do you make it still taste good? and still have textures that people like. Um, so for example, if you look at like, you know, I don't know, Beyond Meat or Impossible Foods, for example, um, you know, they're technology companies. Their focus, uh, like Beyond Meat, their, their focus is through, to create something that is just like, just like meat. So, um, but you know, what is the cost of that, right? Like how much, uh, how much engineering do we, are we doing to the food to, to have that outcome? Um, so, uh, and you know, not that I'm saying it's a bad thing. Um, you know, I think there's many different, like we need many different sort of strategies, I think to create change. So, but we are just, we're more focused on like, you know, really like, I don't want to make food a technology, you know, I'm not trying to get people to eat like a science experiment. We want people to eat real food and enjoy like the, the abundance of, 
you know, fruits and vegetables, basically, because I think there's so much in the, so, so many things that we can do from with food, with fruits and vegetables in their natural state by just, you know, some low processing technologies, combining, combining them together. Um, and I think at the end, you get something that people can feel good about eating. And I think that's, that's important too. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of one aspect is, is that sort of food technology. How do we create this, you know, um, healthier plant-based food that's, you know, not as processed as other plant-based uh, proteins or and stuff like that. And then the, on the other side, we really are focusing on the automation technology in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. So um, that is like, how do we cook food? How do we make food that's better, that's fresher? So for example, we use like all of our food is made on demand. So it's all, um, it's all created to order. So traditional fast food, they use like hot holding. So if you go to like, um, any normal fast food restaurant, your burger will be sitting in like a hot hole cabinet and they'll take it out and they'll just kind of throw on the grill for a minute or not like, or they'll just put a regular burger and eat it. Um, so, you know, you have like product degradation with that. And it's, you know, the idea that you're eating a, a burger, a burger that's maybe 40 years old, is not super appealing, I think, um, to a lot of people. So we really focus on that on demand um, food experience where you're getting something cooked when you order it and you're eating it 10 seconds later if you want to, if you're in the restaurant, right? So I think there's a big appeal to that. So we're, we're really focusing a lot of, uh, of, our, of our technology bill on, on, the, on the restaurant side of things where, um, where we're developing these automation solutions and really advanced cooking technology. And um, we're also, um, uh, you know, developing um, various like, um, um, you know, whether proprietary uh, uh, cooking equipment or machinery that's going to help us accomplish that. Interesting. And so as you look to scale up and continue to invest in the technology and the process side of the business, um, to do so recently, you kind of hit a new milestone or globally locals now, you know, pu publicly listed, traded on uh, the TSX. What was your general experience throughout that process? And I imagine there was probably a few challenges and lessons along the way. I would say taking a public uh, a company public is probably the hardest thing I've ever done, to be honest, as an entrepreneur. Um, it's kind of like it's it's literally like a triple marathon or something or ultra marathon, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's grueling to say the least, and it really isn't for everybody. So uh, I'm not going to come here and say everyone should do this. Um, although I'd love if there was more plant based uh, companies out there. Um, and I, I encourage people to do it, but it's. Just, I think just we just need to understand that it is really challenging, and you you need to be uh, kind of prepared for that. So we spent about I don't know eight nine months, sort of like working like seven days a week, um, getting it done, sort of thing. So there's a lot uh, there's a lot you have to do, um, especially on the financial side. Like that's probably like the hardest aspect of it is, you know being able to get audited financial statements, especially as a startup, like you don't, you don't run a startup thinking about like accounting. Yeah. You know what I mean, it's kind of like an afterthought. It's like, I don't know, like whatever, like we'll figure it out later. You know what I mean? So, um, so, you know, that was, um, but you know, I guess we were kind of lucky, like, um, my wife who like co-founded the company with me, like she was really instrumental in like, in like, you know, doing the books and keeping us like organized and, making sure that we had all the records and that kind of stuff. Cause if you don't have that, you can't go public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really appreciate that James. And so it, like throughout this entire process, it sounds like you're just kind of a natural problem solver. Someone that when you see an opportunity, you kind of jump on it, try and find a way to solve it or do it better. Um, right now, are there currently any problems that you see that maybe you're just too busy to go solve that, you know, if someone was listening to this, they've got that entrepreneurial spirit and they're excited to maybe jump into something. Is there something where, hey, James and Globally Locals way too busy to go tackle this problem, but I do see some sort of opportunity in this space? Well, you know, I mean, again, like we we're focused on, on our mission and we're focused on what we're doing. So I'm not I'm, I'm not trying to you know, solve the problems from a million different ways at this point, you know, although, you know, I think I can see us branching out and doing, you know, more as we kind of grow, but, you know, we are really focused on disrupting fast food right now. And I think that's, that itself is a huge sort of um, undertaking and it's going to take us quite a while to 
sort of work through that. But um, but yeah, I mean, we like we we think there's so much room for for like um, for changing the world in so many different areas. You know, whether that's green tech or that's you know packaging or you know fashion. I mean, there's so many things that we need to solve to make. To, to make the world work and sustainable long term, that uh, you know, we we although we we love to get into everything that you know at this point we're we're just kind of focusing what we're doing. Absolutely, yeah, definitely appreciate that, James. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that I, I wanted to explore with you even further to build off of that, you mentioned that uh, disruption of fast food and. Uh, I love that you've used that term disruption, and it definitely sounds like you're charging forward into that industry. Um, you mentioned earlier you had to go through a bit of a name change on your burger. Uh, have you run into any other uh, roadblocks as as you've been disrupting that very well established uh, niche and industry? Uh, not yet. Nothing yet, other than that. Um, you know, and I guess at the time that was kind of like that was sort of intentional. We were just kind of poking the bear. And just yeah. you know, it, it kind of came swatting back. So, um, and that's fine. You know, it's not a big deal. Um, we're, we're totally fine to kind of like uh, shake things up and you know, um, be that be that kind of organization that is that is that are pushing the boundaries and that's uh, um, you know charging forward, so to speak. Right. So, um, but at the same time, I think obviously now, like uh, especially as a public company, like we're not you know we're we want to do things obviously the right way and we want to do things that is going to, you know, uh, work long term for us. So, you know, we're, we're kind of, I think we're maybe a little bit over like some of the things that some of the stunts that we pulled before, but, um, but that being said, like, I think we're, 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 we're not like saying like we're, we're kind of lying down and just doing things like the standard way. So we are really focused on, on that disruption, but I think now that disruption is really focused on the technology and the economics um, aspect of it, because, you know, really like what we want to do is offer food that is cheaper and better mm. than other people are offering. Right. I mean, cause ultimately like if we're cheaper than the competition, if you know, you're going to go to your favorite fast food restaurant and it costs six nine nine for a burger in our place, it's five nine nine for a burger that is bigger, better, tastier, healthier, better for the planet, better for yourself. Like which one are you going to pick? You know what I mean? You have to make the, you have to make it like a no brainer decision. Like, of course I'm going to go over there. Like, why wouldn't I? <laughs> I'm saving money and I'm getting more full and I'm doing good things for the planet myself and I feel good after eating it. So we, we, we need to figure out a way as how do we disrupt this industry, the industry? And the industry is based on economics. That's what fast food's based on. That's what makes it really different than any other restaurant, you know, it's that they can offer food cheaper than everyone else. So we are really um, figuring that out. Um, and you know, um, I think with uh, with the team that I'm building, with the technology team and the and the food science food science team that I'm building, we're going to be able to pull that off. Absolutely. Now, how have you been able to maintain that connection through COVID with your team? Because you've obviously expanded quite a lot during this time, and you have even bigger plans to expand and open up uh, 20 restaurants across Ontario. So. How do you still maintain that same level of culture or same level of vision across the board as a leader in the company? Well, you know, I, again, I think like every business, like we have just gone remote, you know, Zoom and uh, and and all that kind of stuff. Right. So um, different communication tools for our staff, like we use Slack, for example, with all our staff. And I mean, at the end of the day, the most important thing is that your staff and your management have a way of communicating with with each other and with the organization as long as you have proper communication channels whether you're physically there or not it really doesn't matter you know people feel like they're being listened to and people feel like you know their voice matters and i think that's really the most important thing i think in in an organization so we've really embraced all these all you know all the remote tools um and um you know we we don't have a head office like we don't have like you know, like we all work um, remotely and it'll probably stay that way forever, I'm sure. Um, we just don't need to physically come together anymore. Um, obviously, like, you know, that's not like in the, that, that I'm talking about for like, you know, like upper management sort of stuff. Um, uh, obviously, in the restaurant itself, I think that culture is, is you know, largely kind of like um, its own sort of like world, right? Where 
they are seeing each other every day. They're working with each other every day physically. And that's kind of part of that job. So, um, but yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, I think it's, 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 it is a new kind of world and new way of working and we're, we're embracing it. Awesome. Yeah. And really appreciate you sharing your story with us, James, before we wrap up, I'd love to hear, do you have any advice for aspiring entrepreneurs that are maybe listening to this podcast that are, you know, scared to take that leap of faith? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, I think you're you're never going to look back and say, oh, I, I, I wish I never took that chance or, you know, like you're never, I don't think you're going to regret, you know, trying, even if you fail, because, you know, like I failed tons of times. I've had massive, gigantic failures, you know what I mean? And the thing is, what defines an entrepreneur is your ability to just get up again and just try it again, you know what I mean? So if you if you're able to kind of like um, to do that, if you're able to to say like, listen, I did I failed, but I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna do it again. I'm gonna do something else, or I'm gonna keep trying again and again and again. Ultimately, that perseverance is is something that no one can take away from you, and that perseverance is what's gonna make you succeed. Because if you don't give up, then you actually can't fail. Really, it's a muscle to fail. You just are gonna keep going, keep trying. And I think that's kind of like what I would really kind of say to aspiring entrepreneurs is just don't give up. Just like learn from failure. It's it's just a learning experience, and take that take that failure and make yourself better uh, in the future, and and just just don't stop. Awesome. Yeah, really appreciate that. And so, if people want to follow along with you on your journey, can they? And what's the best way to do so? Yeah, I mean, um, I would say the best way to do so is to follow us on social media. So, Global Local Fast Food on Instagram. Um, we're on LinkedIn. Uh, we're on Facebook, Global Local on Facebook. Um, so, uh, yeah, so just follow along with us there. And I think that's the best way to kind of keep in touch with what we're doing and the, where we're opening up new stores and that kind of stuff. Amazing. Awesome. Well, James, thank you so much for joining the Problems or Profits podcast today. It was such a pleasure chatting with you and learning all about how you've evolved this company into just a global brand. Um, so it's really fantastic to to hear your story and, and what motivated you to um, get to the point that you're at now. So I uh, cannot wait to see what you, what you do in the future and uh, continue to follow along with your journey. So James, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me.